Uh, my name is Wanjohe Njoroge, a climate change activist, um, passionately devoted to ensuring that people and planet coexist. <laughs> Discussions on energy and geopolitics over the last 10 years have often focused on the need for energy security. Now, another challenge is emerging. Climate security, mitigating and managing the geopolitical implications of climate change, and it deserves attention alongside existing energy security discussions. Climate change has become a threat multiplier that is exacerbating existing conflicts and has the potential to cause new conflicts around the world, ones with dire geopolitical implications. Key issues of our time, including cross-border migration, conflicts over water, and competition over territories due to melting ice, for instance, are more deeply intertwined with climate change than previously assumed. Climate change-induced droughts, such as the ones in Uganda's Northern Corridor and Kenya's Rift Valley areas, are contributing to water insecurity and leading to escalating regional rivalries, vying for control over water flows that can often be a deciding factor in determining whether a region will flourish or decline. The changing climate is also fueling interstate competition between major powers over new seaways and land masses laid bare by ice melting at the poles. As communities around the globe, especially those in poorer regions, are suffering increasingly from the negative impacts of climate change, the importance of climate adaptation is becoming more obvious. How do states respond collectively to climate mitigation in a world that is deeply divided on climate action? Is there a potential for a conflict mitigation dividend? And at what level do we engage vulnerable communities at risk and how can they best cope with the negative impacts of climate change? And joining me to help break down this conversation is an absolutely brilliant panel with vast experience, and I will allow them to introduce themselves in under one minute, starting with the youngest, Miss Memo Some, who is joining us virtually. Um, my name is Some, Memo Some. I am from Kenya. I am a youth representative for wildlife conservation and the founder of Wild Enough Foundation, an organization focused on um, recruiting the youth and kids into wildlife conservation. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. What Memo forgot to mention is that she's one of the youngest Kenyans to ever petition parliament. And she petitioned parliament at a young age of 18 years. She is just 20 years today. And she's also my mentee. Um, next, we will have Rashid. Hi, uh, my name is Rashid Ateye. I'm a consultant with the UN Environmental Programs for climate change, uh, oil for development. Uh, I'm originally from Somalia, but I'm joining you from London at this stage, so it's early in the morning. Everybody, good morning. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Honorable Dr. Maria Goretti, uh, the Minister for Karamoja. Thank you. Um, Ms. Njoroge and all participants in your various capacity. I am Kitutu Mary Goretti. I'm uh, an environmental expert. I'm not an activist because I worked in the government for 14 years under the Environment Authority. I was a minister for environment, state for environment, for around four years. I was a minister for energy and mineral development for around two years. And I'm now the minister for Karamoja Affairs. All these dockets have a very rich component where I encounter the impacts of climate change. So I will be sharing with the participants my actual having been the person who prepared even some of the predictions 
when I was still in NEMA, I'm the one now facing the impacts mm. of climate change as a minister. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and, and when I saw your name on the panel, I was, I was wowed because the Karamoja cluster refers to the area of land that straddles between the borders between southern, southwestern Ethiopia, northeast, western Kenya, southeastern uh, South Sudan, and northeastern Uganda. Pastoralism is the dominant socioeconomic activity uh, and source of livelihood for most of the population. The area is highly vulnerable to climate, climatic variations such as drought that renders the communities perennially food insecure and limits their livelihood options. On the Ugandan side, these vulnerabilities were compounded in part by the colonial land policies such as gazettement of fertile grazing land as wildlife con conservation areas uh, and forest reserves. The climatic variations and related uh, resource scarcity have led to frequent violent conflicts among the pastoralist community and often with non-pastoral neighbors. Honorable Minister, I'm curious to know what are some of the measures, please paint the picture for us. How, is, how bad is the crisis uh, within this region and what are some of the measures that the governments have taken, have put into place to try and mitigate against uh, the conflict? Okay, thank you very much. Karamoja as a region has nine districts in Uganda. And truly speaking, it is one of the areas in Uganda with the lowest rainfall pattern that is average 800 millimeters per year. Now, this region is part of the zone that we call the Atekere. Now, Atekere, uh, the pastoral tribes, where for us we have the, the Karamojong, but also in Kenya you have the Trukana, the Usamburu, the Pokots, and in Ethiopia you also have those tribes there. Then in South Sudan you have the Didinga and the Toposa. So all these are pastoralists, and they are in this, they, they inhabit this area which is a pastoral, one of the cattle corridors. It is part of the cattle corridor in Uganda. Now, this is one of the area in Uganda which is water stressed. Mm -hmm. So in Karamoja, you have less water it's in terms of springs. We have more, okay, we have rainfall, but we have more runoff, which goes into the Kenya, into the Choga system. Now, this area, being prone to water scarcity is one of the drivers to conflict. As I speak now, we are conducting a disarmament. Now we are doing it on the Ugandan side, but Kenya is not doing it. So you have the Turkana, the Pokots, then the Karamoja, the Karamojongs in Uganda. Now, but for us in Uganda, we are better in terms of impacts. I think we are in a better situation than the Kenyan side. The Kenyan side is drier. Mm -hmm. Now, as two governments of Kenya and Uganda, we have an MOU. Like I have one of the largest dam, Kobebe Dam. This is shared by the Matheniko in Karamoja and then the Trukana in Kenya. Now we also have cultures within these communities. Like my people, the Karamojong, they have the cattle wrestling culture. And for them, they think it is a right. It is their culture. For them, when a, when a young man grows, you are groomed through the system. From a young boy, when you are looking after sheep, until when you become a warrior, whom we refer to as Karachuna. So there, for them, they don't inherit any cows. So you are supposed to go and raid. It is a culture. You should go and pick someone else's cows, and you also own those. Now we shared, we allowed that let these people graze communally, because Kenya did not have water, but for us we have the Kobebe Dam. Now when the Turkana come with their cows, the culture, that's the source of conflict. The raids begin, and that's what we have been fighting with. So as we speak now, we are yet to sign a framework for implementing the MOU. 
in Uganda, we have a policy to put a valid tank in every parish for adaptation so that these people can settle, they can graze their animals, and also practice agriculture. We are so also restocking. As I speak now, I have about 5,000 warriors whom we have disarmed. And as a directive of government, I will be restocking. Each youth will receive like 15 goats and one he goat, then iron sheets, so that they can settle and we keep them. Now, we are also trying to see how we mitigate the culture, because the culture is also the source of conflict. As we are trying to make them adapt by providing water through dams, but then we also have to mitigate the culture of them picking, because that is also another one that drives the conflicts in Karamoja and then spreads over to Kenya, the, to the Pokots. We, we have that inter-clan conflict, which also worsens the situation. Now, one of the strategies that we are doing in the government, we have to do interministerial collaboration. So, Minister of Education, I think in two years, will begin a strategy whereby we are going to have compulsory and forceful education for all the children of Karamoja. And they should all be in boarding. So that for 15 years, if we have these children in school, there will be a mindset change. And then you can have a new generation and a new Karamoja. And that will be make things better. But as now as a minister of Karamoja, I have culture, you have climate change impacts, all this mix up makes the situation. Then of, of course the security situation, the super armed, that zone also you have the the, the flow of arms from Somalia into Kenya, through Kenya, and you get the Karamojongs also getting the arms. And then they begin killing one another. So in a nutshell, that's what goes on in Karamoja. But as a government, mm -hmm. in terms of climate change, we're adapting new technologies like irrigation. If you go there, you'll find that we have projects where we are promoting irrigation. Our dams, we are put introducing fish so that you uh, improve their source of livelihood. But then again, the culture, these pastoralists don't eat fish. So uh, actually when I went there, the dams were full of fish. And when we had a flood, the fish was actually flowing out. Then they called the neighbors mm. from Teso that come and pick your things. And yet I'm grappling with malnutrition in Karamoja. So you can see change in culture because pastors don't eat fish, they call them snakes. But, but when, you, when they find when you have prepared it, they have not seen it when it is alive, they eat it. So this is what we are changing them, the mindset changed slowly. And I believe within 15 years, Karamoja will be a changed area. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would want us to appreciate some of the things that she has raised. First is the disarm disarmament. disarmament. Um, and they have 5,000 5, warriors disarmed, and they are giving them alternative goats, uh, because this is what they do every single day. So they keep livestock. Um, it's also important to appreciate that it takes time to change culture. It's not something that will be achieved in a day. Um, there is the dam. Um, and resource sharing, allowing the Kenyan side, which is drier than the Ugandan side, to benefit from what Uganda has. And this has to be very, very intentional. And, and, and I have to hail uh, Uganda because they have a, a minister dedicated uh, to Karamoja. So I think that's, that's quite impressive. I think next we will go to Rashid, who is a project officer, joint program on charcoal, uh, that's the PROSCAL, and oil for development. The operative goal for the oil for development, Rashid, uh, is, the econ is the economically, environmentally, and socially responsible management of petroleum resources with safeguards, uh, which safeguards the needs of future generations. We, we say oil is a blessing, but oil is also a curse. 
Oil is a natural resource that has triggered war in very, very many African countries. We could talk of Angola, we could talk of Nigeria. There are very many African countries that oil has triggered um, war. Rashid, the efforts that you're putting in also in Somalia through the PROSCAL program, are we making progress? Is it working? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in a short answer, yes, it is working. But is it uh, to the level that we want to achieve? No, not yet. There we have two things which are parallel. One is the deforestation of uh, small forestry land that we have in the southern side of Somalia. And the problem that we have is naturally the East African region or in general in Africa most of the people they use charcoal for their cookings and somalia is normal uh, but the problem that exacerbated in somalia is uh, the gulf countries are more interested to have the charcoal from somalia and because of the demand the supply is increased so when you have a gulf rich countries who have a lot of money who can do whatever they want. And then you have Somalia, which has got a very weak government. Then you have the trend that a lot of people are felling the trees that were old for more than generations, 100 years old trees, 200 years old trees, just to make a livelihood. One of the problems that we are facing in Somalia is the acacia tree which is one of the precious trees for the livestock a community. Now, if you look from the Gulf country side, they are very interested about that tree charcoal. Reason why is when this tree is felled and charcoal is made from this tree, it has an aroma. That aroma is good for cooking as a charcoal, using the shisha, all kind of thing that they use in the Gulf countries. This became a lucrative business for some people who are doing illegal charcoal cutting. Now, what UNEP has done in collaboration with international community and UN agencies, uh, we became one of the focal points to talk about the issue of deforestation in Somalia. And the UN resolution has been established to make it illegal to export uh, Somali charcoal to those Gulf countries. That has been successful. On the second hand, there was a lot of training that has been done locally with the local community livelihood so they can have alternative livelihoods and that's ongoing. The government has made some regulations that can put in jail anybody who has been caught to cut the trees and transport. United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime are working with us as well to monitor any ships or those that are leaving from any port in the southern side of Somalia to go to the Gulf countries, take a picture and present to the Gulf countries and say this doe or this ship came from Somalia. Also, FAO, which is a part of the PROSCO program, are taking satellite pictures to see the effect of charcoal and cutting trees in some part of the southern side of Somalia. So all in all, we are reaching to a point where now we can monitor whatever is going out of the country, specifically the southern side. Now remember, Somalia, we have one of the largest coasts in Africa, which is 3,300 and plus. And it's difficult to look every corner of the seaside. But we focus more into the southern side, which has the more effect on the climatical change. Now, what happens when you have felling trees and people who are cutting and all that? Number one, we have Al Shabaab in that part of the country. And they're the ones who are benefiting a lot from the charcoal uh, cutting and selling. That becomes a security issues. That's where we are trying to connect 
the climate change and the climate security in that area. Also, we have other partners, international, who are involved in this for their own benefit. So UNODC is working with us to name and shame, to put on the list as a terrorist list, to make sure that that money doesn't come back to Somalia as a weapon or any other means. So there's a lot of angles that we are working with, uh, including UN, uh, NAFOR, which is a European uh, Navy force, who also intercept any dose that has been suspected and they have the rights to inspect. So far, they have succeeded few of them, but once you have one or two that has been apprehended, then the message goes loud and clear. So for the last two, three years, there was no movement. Uh, the satellite pictures that we have with some stocks that has been already apprehended, nothing has been changed. So all in all, in Somalia, there is a progress, but we have not reached where we're supposed to reach in charcoal. Now, coming back to the oil and gas, uh, this region has been blessed in oil and gas. And rightly, people have the rights to explore and to have in a proper manner so they can benefit and can uplift their level of livelihood. As you said rightly, it could be a curse, but it could be a blessing. Now, one must understand what do we need to have a proper oil resource management. Of course, we have a good governance. We have rules and regulations. We need to have an important factor for environmental protection. Now, the climate issue become an issue now, and it's related to climate security. So UN is working or UNEP is working with oil or development program that focuses four major areas. One is a good governance, two environmental impact assessment, including biodiversity, wildlife in, in the area, whether it's a zone or the coastal zone or any other that is being explored. And then financial uh, transparency, uh, so those are the major issues that this UN uh, is working for the oil and development. Of course, there are many countries who are benefiting, including Uganda, and Somalia is a part of that. Now they have completed the rules and regulations of environmental impact assessment, social impact assessment. For those international oil companies who are going to explore in oil and gas, so one must have rules and regulations to make sure that the environment is not damaged like what happened in Nigeria and so. And the other important thing is to have a lot of training for the government so they, have, they can make the right decisions whenever there is an issue when it comes to environment or climate change issue. Thank you. And, and staying with you still, because this, this is something that came up uh, with the Honorable Minister, and you've also raised it when talking about Somalia and the charcoal business. What is the role of neighboring countries in achieving uh, the desired results from your experience? Uh, when we say neighboring countries, in Somalia we have three neighboring countries, starting from Djibouti, uh, Ethiopia, and then Kenya. Now, the side of Djibouti, there's no much going on there because there is no movement of charcoal. The local community, while well, most of them livestock rearing people, they protect their land. Uh, when it comes to Ethiopia, we have a natural relationship with both sides of the border because both sides of the border are Somali communities and both of them are life suffering people. So again, it becomes one of their vital living and when it comes to livestock and cutting the trees, so they don't do, they don't cut. And they are very far away from the seaside. So there's no point of cutting a tree from the border and taking all the way to the seaside to ship it to the Gulf country. Now in the southern part, one, because of security issue and Shabab, 
uh, they have the power to do uh, all cutting trees and take it to the seaside. Uh, but what the Kenyan government is doing is not clear. There was a lot of accusations uh, from the different uh, participants in this program that uh, some of some members of the army were involved as well or participating in this, but there was no hard evidence. And Kenya government completely rejected about this. Uh, so the problem is security issue. Because of security issue, you cannot verify exactly what is happening. Uh, when you talk about country to country, it's a different thing because we have a lot of issues in Kenya when it comes to relationship of uh, business related. They are very cooperative, but when it comes to natural resource sharing, mm. then you already mentioned about the issue of the sea. So there is a lot of tension now. Hopefully that can be solved yeah. soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rashid. And I would want us to see the relationship between uh, climate change and uh, things like Al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab requires funding. And where does the funding come from? Illegal charcoal business. Um, last but not least, we have the phenomenal Some, who is in wildlife. And uh, there has been uh, conflict in a county in Kenya called Laikipia County that is uh, triggered by conservancy. So my question to you, uh, Some, first I would want you to shed a light on the correlation between the conflict in Laikipia and conservation. But who is more superior when we think about wildlife and human conflict? Thank you for that, Wenjuhi. Um, that's a great point, actually. When Honorable Maria, I hope I got her name right, was speaking, I couldn't help but think about Laikipia County, where I came from, because that is the exact same thing that is happening here in Kenya, in Laikipia. Um, Lake Kipia, for those who don't know, is one of the best destinations for wildlife in Kenya. And um, for the last few months, we have been experiencing a lot of human-wildlife conflicts. It is a hotspot for human-wildlife conflicts. But more so, being a pastoralist county, uh, the neighboring communities, due to drought, have been migrating to Lake Kipia for pasture and water. Um, and what this has led is uh, conflict with the settlers. And they have been invading conservancies and national reserves. And the, the predictions of what might happen in the next few months if not, if not any action is taken by the government is there will be high rates of poaching, which had declined for some time here in Kenya. Why? Because a lot of these communities are looking for ways to sustain their livelihood. However, because of climate change in um, the northern part of Kenya with the Samburus, the Pokots, the Turkanas, uh, migrating into Lake Hippia and um, invading the wildlife, they understand the value that comes with wildlife. And therefore what we fear as conservationists is there's going to be a high um, rate of poaching in the next few months. And the, 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 to combat that, um, KDF, Kenya Def Defense Forces, has been taking action in trying to engage the communities and under to, to understand what um, could possibly be the problem and what are the poten potential solutions. Uh, but this is, this is a case that has been, has been going on for years. It's just currently that it is peaking and therefore it needs to be um, discussed even in parliament because in the next few years, Kenya will be going to elections and um, with, with the tribal issues that is happening in uh, Lake Kipia, it, it is a red flag that we need to get up for right now. So um, human wildlife conflict is something that is, uh, has a very strong correlations with climate change. And this can also be experienced not only in Laikipia County, but also in um, Nairobi. Nairobi has the only national park in the city, Nairobi National Park. And regardless of its 
distinctiveness. The park itself has experienced um, immense environmental destruction. And that is what the petition was about, the petition that uh, Wanjuhi just mentioned in 2019, we, we carried out as well now foundation and the youth um, in regards to uh, saving Nairobi National Park from ecological disaster. And, and the reason is to this is because the park has been going through a lot of infrastructure in encroachment. Um, we have the SGR railway passing through Nairobi National Park. We have um, the, uh, the, the, power, the pipeline passing inside Nairobi National Park. We have the power lines passing inside Nairobi National Park. Currently, the migration corridor for the wildlife has been closed in the southern border, interfering with now, uh, the migration during different times for the wildlife. And um, all this is still something that is continuing as many people are preying on Nairobi National Park, regardless of its prestigiousness on a global scale. And um, for a very long time, I remember we were uh, discussing this with a, a colleague of mine that uh, when you were kids, we would go for game drives and you would see most, if not all, of the wildlife in Nairobi National Park. But right now, if you go to Nairobi National Park, uh, you will see maybe just the habibus, and maybe if you're lucky, a giraffe. And the reason to this is because we have not centered our policies on sustainable urbanization, and therefore it reflects on our wildlife and our ecosystem here in Nairobi. And this can be seen in other countries as well, and also in Lake Hippia with the biodiversity. Currently, something that we are going to be having a hybrid of extinction with is with the bees, yet bees are one of the most important features that we need in terms of pollination. Um, and in Lake Ipia County with elephant, um, human wildlife conflicts with elephants, we are trying to set up beekeeping to overcome human wildlife conflict from the elephants, but to also grow the number of bees and also to sustain communities in Lake Ipia. So. Uh, it, 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 is, it is something that we need to think through in terms of policy. And one thing that we are emphasizing on with the youth is to also engage themselves in terms of environmental law and policy and advocacy. I am studying policy and advocacy as of now to be able to counter these issues, to be able to pioneer for the change that we need with our wildlife in regards to climate change. It is, and it is a, a long way to go, but um, as of now, the awareness and the advocacy that has been done so far, we can tell for ourselves on the shoulder for that, yeah. Thank you very much, Somi, and I think listening to you speak, and I know majority of the people in this university and in this room today are young. Uh, we are told that the future belongs to us, but I want to say the present uh, belongs to us, and we have to take action. She talked about environmental law. There is a huge gap in environmental policy formulation that needs to be filled. Um, she talked about sustainable beekeeping as an alternative uh, way of uh, a source of livelihood for the people of Laikipia. And even when you think about uh, forests, I'm very, very passionate about forests myself, and I have done a bit of work. I fought uh, for forests in Kenya, uh, 2018, that, sort, that led to a ban uh, of harvesting of logs, uh, logging in, nat in national and community forests. And climate action cannot be punitive. And human beings have to exist, coexist with nature. So what's the alternative uh, source of livelihood that helps us preserve uh, nature, but also human beings benefit and continue to live? I'm going to open uh, the floor for questions in case there are any questions in the audience, both virtually and in the room. Uh, please shoot them. But in the meantime, as we wait for that, allow me to come to you, Honorable Minister, with all the experience um, that you have. I'm very, very curious. What are the lessons that can be learned to address uh, climate and environmental conflicts? What have you picked out as uh, some of the solutions that we can borrow from your experience. Now, from my experience, lessons which I've learned, which can at least reduce the climate change conflicts, should be having policies in place 
which work and also enforce them. Also, the laws should be enforced. I can give an example of Uganda. Uganda is a country, I think we are one of the countries with the best policies. And some of the, like the environment law, it is one of the best environment laws. But our biggest challenge is enforcement. So that enforcement, because you have a weak enforcement, and also there are other drivers, like you, are, you have a fast growing population, which has to feed. And that's why we have lost most of our forests, because the forests were turned into agricultural land. So I would think proper planning, in terms of physical planning, having that intergovernmental, interministerial planning is very important. To, because for you, as a Minister of Environment, you are planning this. Like she said, they are passing the lines through the national park. Is that the only area? There are many areas. So people take these protected areas as free so you can go and do anything that you want. And these are some of the issues that are actually worsening the climate change impacts in terms of weather variation. Because for us, like in Africa, we have very almost minimal emissions but we are impacted more. So the best thing is to adapt and mitigate. So those forests act as carbon sinks. Like you look at Uganda, they, they could cushion us from some of those impacts, but we are worsening the situation. You, 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 then also the natural resources. You, you see, they struggle for all those. You know, the wetlands, our wetlands actually provide us 40% of the rainfall. But we, and you know, wetlands act as, also they, 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 they keep the methane gas, which is one of those gases which warms the earth. But we are opening them up, so we are losing water, releasing methane in, methane in the atmosphere, and at the end, you don't have water. I used to be a minister of energy, mm. and one of the risks that we have with that Nile is right now we have enough rainfall, yes. The hydro dams are giving us electricity. But if we have a drought, that's why we have also energy security. We may have to have another alternative. We are now going for industrialization. But if the Nile goes below, we need source of electricity that can drive all these industries. And that may be the, the only way to go for nuclear energy. As a minister, minister of energy, that was what I was advising Edward. But to just conclude, as Africa, we need to work as a block. Because you find others are putting in effort I used to sit in the Africa debate when we would go to, like now they're in the COP, they are, I think we are pushing our issues as Africa. But when we come back, we forget what we, they have now done in Glasgow and you begin doing working as Uganda, another one is doing as Kenya. But if we worked as a block, we would be able to achieve in terms of, because we are the continent actually which will be impacted more because we have the highest population that is vulnerable, we have least technologies, so we are really at risk. Mm -hmm. But we are the ones who are least, when you look at our budgets, I used to be a minister of environment, other ministries would share everything, then for you, you are given last. And yet, we warned right now as I speak, the minister of disaster does not sleep. All the displacement, the lake has displaced people. I mean, floods. The other day I went to go home. I couldn't reach home. The bridge has gone. So these are now, now where do you get this money immediately? It means the budget has to be disrupted. Yet people have to go back to school. We've gone back through COVID. So, and this we warned when I was in NEMA. We said we either have to prepare ourselves like 10 years ago, or else we shall face what's happening now. 
So the costs of, environment, of the climate impacts in Uganda on our budget are very visible. And as youth who are in Makerere, I'm an OG over here, the future is yours. Please don't allow this generation to eat into your, hmm? you know, with the climate change, the, we may be already eating in what you should have, mm. what you should be using, maybe 20 years to come. That's what I had as what I'm, I'm going to open it up, but before I do, what is stopping us, Madam Minister, from doing all these things? You want us 10 years ago, you want Uganda 10 years ago. Uh, we are still seeing, uh, we're still talking about the same thing today. Nothing is being implemented. We go to COP26 as Africa, we come back as Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda. Yes. What is stopping us from executing? What is stopping us from moving forward and, and executing and taking this threat seriously? There is one thing which I've even said before, even at COP. I think sometimes it is not being focused to say we, or, or sometimes we don't take even climate change as an issue. When you come back, you think, Okay, that could be a hoax, like some people think. And other things, it is greed. Like when you look at some of these people who go into cutting forests, like they are saying, it is greed. People wanting to get more than they... Why do you go into the wetland? Why should you really go to cut forests, which are protecting the lake, when Uganda still has free land? We are not yet land stressed. You find people already in the Central Forest Reserve putting pressure, shouldn't we disgazette in Karamoja, that even those who are going into the national park, but we are not yet land stressed as yet. So we should stop greed. Then number two, political interference. I'm a politician. Even those who, who, who are doing wrong, the community, because you are the ones who vote me, you go into the forest, then you run to me to protect you. I know you are doing something wrong, but because I need your votes. So that fear of telling the community or the population to do the right thing is also what is bringing problems. And these are facts. So we either, the community have to change and either say that let's do the right thing, or else now they are all now crying. Yesterday we were passing, I think yesterday but one, we were passing a supplementary. But after the supplementary, I think the Minister of Disaster, literally people ran, ran after him. Those who have MPs whose communities have been hit by hailstorms. So it is going to disrupt the planning of the country. Even the middle income status, by the way, may not be achievable if we don't handle the issue of climate change very decisively. This is a fact, and it should go on record. If we cannot handle climate change as one of the beasts we have to fight, the roads that we are building are being swept, the bridges have gone, so we go back to where we started. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. It's an honor to have you with us, and thank you very much for the very insightful um, contributions of yours. My name is Anna Reismann. I'm country director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Uganda in South Sudan. It's great to have you with us. You have been very honest with us in very many aspects why climate change adaptation might not be taken as seriously as it would, you know, as it's due to happen. You have pointed out in your last contribution the political aspect of it, that uh, politicians, they fight for votes. And uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, together with another partner, we actually had an analysis of electoral campaigns in some African countries. Um, and just to look into when a politician runs a campaign or talks about climate change in his or her political campaign when going into elections, we found out that 
these politicians are actually um, rather not to be elected. So when a politician comes with a topic of climate change, it's something that is not taken seriously by the population um, and they think that these um, political actors do not really address the topic that is of importance to them because they do not see the climate change issues as a um, bread and butter issue. They think they have so many real problems that talking about climate change is just something you know out of the um, academic universities. So I think it is on the time to also understand how to approach this topic, how to make people understand that it is indeed a, a bread and butter issue, how to break it down um, into a language that makes uh, also the population, the voters, understand that um, the impacts of climate change um, are really, um, you know, very, very felt in their own life and they just do not make this uh, connection. Um, and I think it's very difficult to do so when we talk about the percentages and how the temperature will rise because one cannot connect to it. So I think it's also um, on the time to find the right language to reach out. Then you have been also talking about how many ministries are actually involved into the problem resol uh, um, solutions um, that come out of the climate change. You have been mentioning uh, the Ministry of Disaster, of the Ministry of Environment, your own ministry. So all of them are already playing a role in uh, adaptation and in mitigating. Um, then you have mentioned the international level, and we had yesterday a conversation on vaccines. And we were asking, so why is the uh, COVAX facility not as um, successful as it could be? Although the WHO, uh, you know, is really willing to do it, to make it a success. And uh, our experts were telling us, well, you know, there is not enough mutual trust also into international cooperation right now. You know, the states ju just do not trust each other and the willingness of cooperating is also quite low. So, um, and this is also true, I am afraid, for climate change. Um, and last but not least, we today um, put not only the topic of climate change and the consequences of climate change um, on the agenda, but also the crisis that the adaptation mechanisms and strategies um, could actually um, initiate or um, cause, because if we have an adaptation to certain climate change impacts on the maybe local or national level, and we know we need the international or regional international community to get into it, so the risk is that while trying to mitigate uh, the issue of adaptation to climate change impacts in your own country, you might cause new conflicts with neighbors. So how, how this is taken into account uh, right now? And um, I'm sorry for this long comment, but I just wanted also this young audience to understand mm -hmm. basically what the value of what you have been mentioning, because I think it's on them also to understand when now the politicians go and talk about environment, do not just dismiss it. And the, po the young population in, in this country is the majority. So I think they should also, you know, get prepared to a different discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I see three questions out of that. First is creating awareness. How do we educate the citizenry on the threat, the, cri the climate threat, um, and also the opportunities that exist in climate, cha in climate action? Um, working together, the ministries involved, the countries involved, how do we begin to trust each other? And then number three and most important, the crisis uh, likely to come out of adaptation uh, or mitigation that individual countries take up. 
uh, how do we ensure that by solving one problem we are not creating 10? Um, and she raises a very important point on the youth that uh, Uganda is actually one of the youngest countries globally. Over to you, Minister. And then please keep your questions short so that we have 15 minutes. Let us utilize them well. Over to you, Madam Minister. Thank you very much for making some of those observations. Yes, the issue of mindset change is something very important. And you know, whenever we talk of mindset change, people think you go for the communities, those local people. But we may need mindset change beginning even from the decision makers. So that people, and this is, if, when we begin thinking that we need to put money where it should be put, then you can be able to avert, to avoid some of the expenses that we are going through. I can give an example. Right now, we are paying a lot of money in terms of repairing bridges. I think we sh the Ministry of Finance will have to come up with that. But that should have been avoided by just putting money to make and we protect the catchments. So planting trees would have been cheaper than now repairing bridges. Now, these are some of the things which you need, need to make sure those who make budgets, the parliament, and you know the parliament keeps on changing. You mentor some, you get a new group. So it, it is actually something when you raise it, it is a very serious thing. Now, country is not collaborating. This, I've been a minister. I've ever gone, I've led delegations to COP. We debate as Africa, we come back, even our real immediate neighbors. You don't have any. Even the East African community protocol, you don't really see those synergies where we are really committed and working. We say, please, let's protect this as East Africa. Now, once we come back, everybody goes to Uganda, another one goes back to where, and we begin from where you, start, where, where you stopped working as Uganda. You only reach at the border, peep the other side, and come back and work as Uganda. And I think this is where we really need to improve because, like you said, there are certain things that you can do. It will affect another country. I can give you another example. We have River Semliki, which is silting Lake Albert at a very high rate. So the water is rising, and we have around 3,000 people displaced. And the only area where we have to take them, there is no land, because this is like a gorge, you know, that is in the Alberta and Graben, and there was that rifting. The only area is to go for the national park. Now, the national park, our constitution does not allow any degazettement of a national park. So you now have to go back to parliament to change the law in order to have these people displaced who have been displaced. And these are fishermen. We said, can we take you somewhere else? No. For us, we want to be on the lake. Because our livelihood is fishing. So you can see something that started as degradation in another country has created a chain of problems in other countries. So the, you, what you are mentioning, uh, we are seeing them as live examples. And this we now need to talk to one another as countries so that we can be able to solve those problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to take questions for the other two panelists. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Atmeska Derek Collins, and I'm um, the UCM and Chiyandong district, and also an activist. Uh, I come from an oil-rich region of Western Uganda, and uh, there is a lot of climate change activities that are taking place in that particular region. Uh, of recent, we led a campaign against, against Bugoma Forest, which was Save Bugoma Forest, whereby the government of Uganda was trying to give it out to investors of Hoima sugar and so on 
to plant their sugar canes. Now, here, Honorable Minister says that our government has the best policies in the whole of East Africa and Africa at large. But to my dismay, I would really to bring it to her attention that which kind of policies would you think that they are best and yet they are giving out the forest that would save the nature of our people in the country. Then too, we have seen a lot of displacement of people in our region. For instance, that there is the Kingfisher oil pipeline that is going to start of, of in the next few months or years. But we have seen that a lot of forests and people have been displaced from their areas and there is nothing that is being done by the government. So, Madam Honorable, I'd really want to seek your attention that which kind of policies are you putting in place to save the nature and maybe the climate change of the people from Bunyoro sub-region. Thank you very much. Thank you for granting me the opportunity. Uh, I'm Vicky Namgobe, uh, youth leader representing the youth of Sironko to the National Youth Council, that's in Bugisu sub-region. Uh, basically, I was watching the news of late concerning the COP26 at Glasgow, and one of the things that caught my attention was uh, the issue of climate financing and climate budgeting. And we happened to get a representative of Uganda, that is the Honorable Minister Anywa, trying to deliberate on that issue. We, well, in Africa, we know uh, in relation to climatic change, we are one of the least carbon emitters in this nation or in the world. And then, unfortunately, when they were talking about the climate financing, it came to my knowledge that they are trying to, the developed countries that are emitting more of the carbon are supposed to give, if I understood it well, some bit of financing to the developing countries that have less of the carbon emitters. And it's to my dismay that I came to understand that the money that is going to be given to us or that they are planning to give to us is going to be on a basis of a loan, not a grant. So I am, again, we are, as, yes, moving into the globalization aspect, we have that thing that is related to specialization or division of labor. Are they trying to say that, really, since, should we really necessarily carry on a burden of what we do not emit? Is it a right decision? Is it justifiable and equitable for us to carry on a burden of a loan, yet we do not emit a lot of carbon emissions out there. And then the second thing I really wanted to understand, with the climatic change challenges, initially in African traditional society, there were, we had insecurities of, of food, food security, insecurity. And this would lead to migration, moving from one place to another in order to find that security. Now, climatic change has changed the patterns of weather. And we find it that the rainfall doesn't come at the right full season, the sun is too much and all that. In Sironko, in my district, we had five sub-counties that were massively affected by the, over the excessive rainfall. And we had terrible landslides. People were displaced and people are still suffering. We have food insecurity. So as Africa, what are we doing? Oh, let me break it down to Uganda. As Africa, what are we doing in, to gain the food security that we really need in times of disasters when they come about. In African tradition society, we had granaries. We would store in granaries, and it would help us in time of disasters. But currently, our ministers of disasters in Africa, in Uganda, what are we doing about that to see that we secure food? Because uh, uh, a next scenario, I would say, no, let me stop there and give an opportunity to someone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to bring Rashid to tackle the two questions. One, on climate financing, the money that is coming, which I believe is 100 billion US dollars, and uh, also the change of climatic conditions. How do we ensure that we are food secure as Africa? Rashid? Uh, thank you. Uh, the issue of climate finance is something that has been going on in the world uh, for the last few years. And it has not reached to a level that the African countries can participate because of lack of uh, understanding. Uh, 
The, the problem that we have in Africa is when it comes to the issue of carbon credit, uh, or when you talk about carbon sequestration, then one has to understand the means and the mechanism that this system can work. Now, if you have a system that you don't understand, then it becomes a problematic uh, to get a benefit. There are a few countries in East Africa region that started uh, to benefit slowly and on a small scale, uh, but still there is a long way to learn and to make it profitable according to their own needs. Now it has a, it, it's like a flip of coin. Uh, it can be a problem and a burden when it comes to a loan, and it can be a beneficial when it comes to a grant. It all depends about negotiations and how you negotiate. There are a lot of countries in the Western world who are polluters, and as an environment, you know the polluter pays the principle. But that is not taking place because of lack of understanding, lack of information, and sometimes twisting the rules according to their own needs by the big polluters. So Africa needs to educate itself, especially the young generations, other universities have to learn more. And that's a responsibility of the government, specifically the education sector. The other thing is that the negotiations between the African countries and those global big companies who are polluting, they have to have a good negotiations of how are we going to tackle the issue of climate and climate uh, change because it doesn't have any border. So when you don't have a border, if somebody pollutes in Sweden something, it comes to Africa. So in that sense, there has to be a good communication, good understanding, and a good uh, uh, negotiations. When it comes to the issue of uh, food security and mitigation, yes, we are lacking behind. As rightly the minister said, uh, the ministers of disaster and environment are the least ministers who will get uh, funding or they get budget or they get the least budget. But when something happens, is when everybody says that, okay, where do we go and how do we get the money to solve the problem? And that mindset has to stop and that has to be changed. And I think where to start is from the education point of view. So the public has to be educated. The ministry has to be educated. The member of the parliament has to be educated. The youth has to be educated. So there's a long way to go to do all this uh, in a parallel manner then we can reach a place which we can say now we can do something if you talk about the bridge and you are trying to solve the issue of trying to repair the bridge but you don't have, you don't look about the root cause then you are not solving the problem so really really what we need to do is to look the root cause of this which is basically climate change climate security issue for example if you have a farm and then that farm doesn't get the rain. What you need to do is to move and see if you can find somewhere else. Or if you have a livestock, livestock herder and your animal doesn't have a grazing, then you have to move and go somewhere else. Imagine you go to the other community and you encroach in their land. That's where the conflict starts. And that's exactly what climate security is all about. It's a natural resource sharing and competition of natural resources. So food security is part of that. And if we don't think holistically, we don't look at it, the whole thing, then we cannot reach the conclusion. So there's a lot of angles to look at it. And one has to take uh, the best options. There's no silver bullet here, but we have to come together and solve this issue together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to closing uh, remarks, but before then, I think when it comes to the issue of climate financing, we need to remember what the minister said. We cannot do it alone. We have to do it as a block. Um, lack of understanding. This is virgin land. We as young people need to tap into this opportunity of understanding what climate financing is and even become consultants for government for it. Um, Some, I want, allow me to come to you. 
COP is happening. Are you happy? Are you hopeful? Or are you disappointed? And feel free to quickly comment on any other issue or question that has been raised. Over to you, Some. For that one, Johe. Um, let me start with the issue of food security. Uh, one important point that we need to mention in regards to adoption of climate change um, for food security is diversification of crops. Um, and this is something that we have been trying to work on as the youth, especially the youth in the agricultural field. Um, we need to take advantage of our technology. And uh, the lady who presented that question pointed out the traditional methods in which we stored our foods um, even in the olden days. But currently, we can plant more fruit, more foods and fruits, not depending on the season, but depending on the technology that we use. And therefore, that has become one of the mechanisms that we are focusing on for food security in relation to climate change. And in addition to um, the COP26, um, there is a lot to say about the COP26 this year. Um, as a youth, I, I wouldn't say it was um, a successful event. And the reason to this is because the youth have been a very big um, component in terms of climate justice with advocacy. Um, but my concern comes in with, in regards to the gap between advocacy and action plans, right? Advocacy is brilliant. And I think it's the first step to real, realizing a problem. However, uh, it's gotten to a point as the youth, we need to associate ourselves with action plans. Um, and in the beginning, I pointed out that uh, there's been a lot of prediction of what will occur in regards to um, climate crisis in future. But have we prepared ourselves for that? And a good country that I love giving an example of, in, of this is Rwanda. I have been in Rwanda a couple of times. And something I admire about the country is they are less on advocacy and big on action. They talk less, but there's a lot of action to see the effort that they, they put um, in terms of climate change. And I think where we are currently as a youth, we, are, we have been exposed to a lot of information in regards to the topic. We, have, we know how to combat these issues. However, we have not been linked to, part, to being part of solving the problem. And therefore what was happening in COP, um, um, this year's COP was uh, from a youth perspective, there was brilliant advocacy. Uh, but I would love to challenge the youth to, to do more, especially in terms of, uh, I don't know if I'm the only one who saw from the Queen Peace UK, the inclusion of uh, gender, let me read that correctly, uh, gender inclusive, inclusivity in regards to climate change. And another challenge that I would just want to give to the youth out there is you're talking about inclusivity of gender, especially in climate change. Um, a note that I pointed out was all the keynote speakers were ladies, and this is just something for the boy child to think about that they also need to up their game in regards to being part of um, solving climate change. Thank you. Um, the solutions that were presented by our leaders are brilliant solutions, but what we'll see between now and the next year's COP might be an extension of just advocacy and talking, but there's no action plan. So that is my concern. And in, in terms of um, Africans' participation uh, in COP26, we need to work together as Africans to combat these issues. And therefore, what um, the, the, uh, Honorable Maria had pointed out in the beginning, we shouldn't uh, leave the conference and come. I go to Kenya, she goes back to Uganda, Rwanda, and we settle on our issues lo locally in our country. This is a global issue that requires a global effort. Thank you and very therefore, much. I believe COP26 uh, uh, 
brought out a lot of brilliant solutions but my concern will be the implementation mm -hmm. and also for the youth inclusion in terms of actualizing this project not just advocacy i think it's time for the youth to now up their game in not um, just doing less of talking and more of being part of solving the problem thank you thank you very very much uh, more action less talking honorable minister there were two questions to you um, save bugoma forest and also the oil pipeline. Okay. Please respond to that and, and quickly. Thank you very much. I think for Goma, this is before cabinet, mm. and usually we don't divulge issues that are before cabinet in public. But I'll be talking as an environmentalist and as a minister who one time oversaw Goma Central Forest Reserve. Now, in Uganda, we have 506 central forest reserves. These were areas which were carefully, if you look at most of those forests, they were carefully selected using science and they were protected for a purpose. And when you go to the National Forest Authority, you will get information on why this forest was protected and why this was protected. But like I say, it is greed. Why go to Bugoma? I went to open boundaries for Bugoma Central Forest Reserve. Bugoma is a government central forest reserve. But the issue is just people's greed. Me, that's what I can say. And, uh, but we are working hard to see that that system is protected. Bugoma Central Forest Reserve, in terms of diversity, is richer than Queen Elizabeth and Matson Falls, if you didn't know. So there are animals. Actually, I was the one who led the baseline survey for oil and gas. But we discovered animals we even didn't know existed in Uganda, flying squirrels. So it is a highly rich area, and it is unfortunate that that went to, but as government, we are doing our best to see that we are able to agree with the kingdom and we have that impasse resolved. Now, the oil pipeline, that's the ECOP, having been the Minister of Energy, I was the one who signed the agreements for clearing the construction of the pipeline. Now, my young son, Yes, uh, it is good to be an activist, but also read. I would ask you that go and read. Actually, most of these projects are well packaged. The environmental safeguards are well laid out. So there are even more, I'm even more worried of projects outside the oil world than what is there. They are very, like now look at Kampala, I'm more worried of Kampala than the Albertine grabbing because there, what Total is doing, Total is an international company which cannot compromise its standards. So don't allay the your fears. I know there are NGOs which have been what, but come and you will be able to get the right information. So that the oil pipeline will go through, and it was carefully selected, the route, we did what we call a sensitivity analysis, environmental sensitivity analysis. So it avoids environmental sensitive areas. So that is a way of mitigating some of the impacts. So um, bringing hope for those who may have been reading on social media that you know the pipeline is going to bring this. I would only task you the youth that prepare to go and get jobs in that area. Because I saw an advert where they are asking you people to apply, but I had to, if, I'm a member of cabinet, and say, you cannot begin asking. Ugandans who have never owned oil for 20 years experience, where would we get the 20 years experience? And here we are going to put a spirited fight to see that you get those jobs. So that's what I would ask you to do. But in terms of environmental protection, the oil activities are well cushioned and don't have any worries. Just only fight for your jobs. There are many jobs there, and when I was a Minister of Energy, I was fighting to see that the local content 
we have at least 33% of the jobs ring fenced for Ugandans, more especially the youth. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. That's all the time we had. And thank you for being an awesome audience. Uh, God bless. I think all that is pending is a photo uh, of me and the minister. Over to you, program director.